This video is sponsored by Wondrium. Click the link in the description below to start your free trial today. If there is one thing that has been proven time and time again by our journey through the history of life, it is the fact that no species lasts forever. These periods of time that we talk about are human constructs to help us wrap our minds around the sheer vastness of geologic history. And these expanses of time are often punctuated by something bad happening to the things that were alive at the time. These are the extinction events that we normally consider that period's concluding incident. The ones that leave life looking different enough on the other side that we can say that it is appropriate to label everything that follows in the geologic record belonging to an entirely different period. This has happened to some extent at the conclusion of each of the episodes in this series. And in fact, smaller extinctions have happened intermittently throughout time that I had not even mentioned because the overall effect on the big picture of the story was relatively unaffected. The point here is that extinction is actually a natural part of life. As long as the world keeps changing, life will continue to change with it or fall by the wayside. And in that process, there will always be winners and losers. With that being said, however, there are also some events that happened that are so overwhelmingly devastating that life very nearly didn't bounce back. Disasters that nearly took our planet full of life and eradicated it. These are the true mass extinctions. The ones where easily 70% of the species were wiped out or more. And it has only gotten this bad a handful of times. But even among those mass extinctions, this one is the standout. This is the single most devastating event that life on Earth has ever seen. So, I decided that rather than cover it in one segment of the late Permian video, that it needed its own chapter. Because over the roughly one million years that this event took place, our world would be changed forever. Ah, Tim Tim, you survived the initial blast. Stick with me, and you may live to see the Triassic, as we cover the Great Dying. So, if you couldn't tell from the last couple of episodes, there was a build-up to this. Ever since the continents had started to come together in the Carboniferous, there had been a steady rise in volcanic activity. This led to more mountain ranges rising up during this time than any other time previously. Now, there are other theories about things that could have contributed to this great loss of life, but there is one situation and one location that seems to be the most likely cause. An alarmingly large area of Russia that today we call the Siberian Traps. This nearly 7 million kilometer area is marked by the presence of basaltic rock a type of igneous rock formed from the rapid cooling of low-velocity lava, usually rich in magnesium and iron. Now, this is a jarring find not only because of the vastness of the area, but also because, at a glance, it really shouldn't be here. Because Siberia doesn't sit on a tectonic plate boundary like you would expect from a location where a volcano might go off. But this situation was different. Instead of the more common cause of volcanism, especially during this time, when two tectonic plates pushing into each other can cause an eruption, it is believed that this was caused by a mantle plume, where a massive amount of magma starts to work its way up to the surface from the mantle. As this happens, the above layers of crust melt and actually fuel the momentum of this event, until finally it reaches the surface and well, this. This type of situation does not act like a normal eruption. They are a slow burn that started with several eruptions throughout the area, where lava spews out of the ground, essentially forming an inland sea of lava at the surface. And in this case, about the size of Greenland. 
This mantle plume probably exploded continuously for about a million years, with certain points of heightened activity and long periods of it just seeping lava, all concluding in one final massive explosion. Now, as if this wasn't bad enough, there are also many long-term effects to consider. Such as the fact that as all this magma spewed up from the wound in our crust of the planet, there would be a massive amount of greenhouse gases being released as a byproduct, along with a chemical known as halocarbons. Now, for those who don't know, these types of chemicals are directly linked to all sorts of environmental and health issues for anything exposed to it. And maybe someday I'll do a video talking about all the times that we've monkeyed around with this stuff, leading to some pretty bad results. Besides being directly toxic to any animals, it would also rapidly break down the protective ozone layer of our atmosphere. And with greenhouse gases like methane getting pumped into the air, and a layer that protects our planet from heating up too much from the sun being broken down, I'm sure you can see where this is going. Ironically, despite the eruptions of the Siberian traps absolutely spelling certain death for any animals living in that region of Pangaea, it may not have been the blasts themselves that led to the widespread global die-off that took place, but instead a slow die-off of being poisoned, choked, and starved as the planet first got cold as a result of the sun being blotted out by the ash and dust, only to start to warm faster than ever when the dust finally cleared and the ozone layer was no longer protecting the planet. And by far, the worst effects of this would be felt in the seas, where global warming would effectively starve the oceans of oxygen as well as raise the acidity of the water. Our oceans had been busy with life for almost 300 million years at this point. It is where our story, as well as the story of everything else, began. And although it had had its fair share of die-offs along the way, nothing has compared to this. And in fact, it's safe to say that nothing ever will shy of the actual death of our planet. Because... If you looked at the oceans 251 million years ago, you would swear that's exactly what was happening. Many faces that had become staples up until now, some going all the way back to the Cambrian explosion, were completely erased. The echinoderms were almost entirely wiped out, with 98% of the cranoids and 100% of the blastoids dying out. Bivalves lost 59% of their species, which is lucky by comparison, or a testament to how hardy the simple yet effective design of a clam is. The gastropods would lose 98%, showing how close we came to such a simple creature as a snail no longer being part of our world. But if you want to consider what a very different world specifically in the oceans would have been like, we also very nearly lost corals as well, with 96% of the Paleozoic coral species dying out. If there were any Eurypterids left by this time, they were completely gone. Although there is some debate on whether the last of them were already gone by the end of the Permian. But what we do know is that this was finally the end of the line for the Trilobites a class of organisms that had endured everything that the animal kingdom as well as the planet itself could throw at them for a staggering 270 million years were done. And although it's hard to pinpoint exactly how hard the cephalopods were hit, because many species don't have many hard parts to fossilize to begin with, there was one exception, the ammonites. And unfortunately, the news wasn't good. 97% of them would completely disappear, including 100% of the Ghaniatites that we talked about being super abundant during the Devonian. Several groups of vertebrates were wiped out, including many species of conodonts, bony fish, and chondrichthians. All in all, an absolutely unfathomable 96% of the genera that existed 252 million years ago 
would be gone in the million years or so that this event took place, leaving the majority of the globe looking very similar to how it did in the days before the Ediacaran, covered in a vast, barren ocean. Although the loss of life on land was not quite as all-encompassing as it was in the oceans, it was still absolutely devastating. There was a steep drop-off in many different kinds of gymnosperms and seed ferns. Also, the total extinction of another group of plants called the Gigantopterids, which had previously made up the most abundant types of plants in the rainforest of the South China Islands. Although some smaller species may have survived, this was the end of this type of forest. And the collapse of the coastal forests would result in many species disappearing. The land invertebrates would not fare much better than the marine ones, with this being the single largest extinction event that insects have ever suffered with some estimates as high as 85% of terrestrial arthropod genera disappearing. And since both plants and invertebrates make up the base of any terrestrial food web, this was absolutely going to have a dire effect. When it comes to the vertebrates, amphibians like the Timnospondyls were almost completely wiped out, weakening their grip as the dominant hunters at the water's edge. Many different groups of reptile that had been competing with the synapsids directly had been reduced in diversity or completely driven to extinction. Most notably was the para-reptiles like Scutosaurus. But as I've said before, when there's a collapse of a food web, it's always the animals on top that fall the hardest. And this time, that was the synapsids. Many of the different species of Dicynodonts, like Bulbasaurus and Diictodon, would not make it out of the Permian alive. And without the forests, neither would Suminia or its neighbor Solorosauravus. But one of the hardest hit groups of all would be the Theriodont carnivores, with all of the Gorgonopsids and almost all of the Therocephalians dying out. All in all, 70% of life on land would be taken out over the course of a million years, leaving our planet a barren, lifeless husk of what it had been seemingly last week. But as bleak as this situation seemed, there was still a very slight sliver of hope. Life on this planet would never be the same. We talk about this event being the moment when the synapsids lost control of the Earth to the diapsids, but the reality is, nothing alive at this moment was doing well. The animals that would make it through this time were the generalists who were going to have to scrape just to get what they needed to get by. As the dust settled, the world that would be revealed would be a truly sick planet. It was dry hot and barren, with many of the areas that had previously been able to grow forests succumbing to desertification. But a few animals were hanging on. For one thing, the Dicynodonts, and more specifically, Lystrosaurus, who, despite seeing many of their cousins perish, were about to boom in population across the southern half of Pangaea. Going into the early Triassic, Lystrosaurus was the single most common species on Earth. For a while, 95% of the land vertebrates were these pig-sized stem mammals, a biodensity that to this day cannot be rivaled by any species, including humans. A few Therocephalians and Cynodonts managed to hang on as well, but the former would struggle to gain anything resembling the apex predator status they had held in the late Permian. The Cynodonts were likely able to hang on by staying small and not needing as much food as the Gorgonopsids and Therocephalians, and this would be the strategy that would carry them through the next era of Earth's history. In the seas, Life was broken, but the small 4 or 5 percent of what was left of each of the different groups would eventually start to rebuild, but it would take a long time. 
And although it's hard to see this as anything else other than doom and gloom, there was one group of animals that would eventually stand to benefit from this great dying. Allow me to introduce Proterosaurus. This is a seemingly unassuming diapsid reptile not unlike many that we have already met before. But this one might be different, because this reptile is actually the most primitive member of a clade of reptiles called the Archosaurs. And with so many players being wiped off the board, this would be the face of things to come. Which is the perfect time for me to mention today's sponsor. Tim Tim, you're up. Tim Tim, get up. It's time to go to work. <laughs> All right. Well, since I guess he's out of commission, I guess I'll have to do it. But that's okay, because today I'm thrilled to talk about this episode's sponsor, Wondrium. Please visit wondrium.com slash paleoanalysis to start your free trial today. If you're a fan of this channel, then I'm guessing that you love learning, since that's kind of what we do. And Wondrium is a premier entertaining and educational video subscription service that enriches your overall life experience with approachable, comprehensive, and illuminating content. It's a museum for your mind, an institution for your imagination, and a gallery for your personal genius. If you sign up for a free trial today, I highly recommend checking out the outstanding course Rediscovering the Age of Dinosaurs a series of courses that tells the story of how life bounced back from the great dying that we've been discussing as the dinosaurs rose to take over the world. So it's almost like a sneak peek into where we'll be going next in the history of the Earth. But with this 24-part series hosted by paleontologist Christy Curry Rogers, it gets far more in detail than I ever could. And it's not just paleontology content either. You could check out Discovering West Africa, Forbidden Literary Works, or Off the Beaten Path. I highly recommend checking Wondrium out. Wondrium is where you find the answers to everything you've ever wondered about, and some things that you never imagined you would wonder about. Their carefully curated collection of short and long-form videos, tutorials, how-tos, travelogues, documentaries, and more is academically comprehensive, thoroughly researched, relentlessly entertaining, and presented by engaging experts. In a nutshell, Wondrium is the place for minds that wonder. Again, go to wondrium.com slash paleoanalysis, or click the link in the description to start your free trial today. This is the closest our planet has ever come to going from a gem thriving with life in our galaxy to a desolate world like Mars. All in all, around 90% of the species that were alive in the Permian were gone. But luckily, from a small handful of hardy survivors, Somehow, life would bounce back. But it would be forever different. Because from here on out, we are in the Mesozoic Era. But today, our Earth is wounded. And it will take time to recover. If you enjoyed this video, I highly recommend watching the 10 previous episodes of this series so far. I fully intend to keep going with this until I get back to the modern day and my human form. And I want to thank you all for joining me on this journey. Have a good one, everybody.